Welcome back and, and, and welcome to the new folks that are joining us. Um, if you're new to the sessions, I just want to remind you to kind of please bring in your fellow women Zooglers to these sessions. What we're trying to do is really increase the engagement of this amazing network uh, that, that Chris and Kush and, and others over at Blueprint, now Key, officially renamed Key, uh, have, have built for all of us. And we've heard over the last like eight weeks, all the amazing ways that you can tap this network um, and that you can contribute to it. So I encourage you to, to draw more folks in and, and use the network. And this is just one of the ways that you can uh, engage with, with Zooglers. We've covered career change, career progression, overcoming adversity, career after Google, uh, leadership. So we've done a whole bunch of topics, but the women we have today could cover all of those topics. Um, <laughs> I've broadly called it succeeding in the C-suite because both of them spent a, a lot of time there. Uh, Cheta has built executive teams working directly with Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos. She even sold her own talent company to Groupon in a bidding war against Amazon. Uh, while she was at Google, she was supporting Marissa's uh, team, Marissa Meyer's team, as well as supporting all of our international subsidiaries and building teams there. So she has a ton of experience in, in the C-suite and working with executives. Uh, Suzanne, likewise, comes to us. She's CEO of Mobcoy. Uh, a, a mobile ad agency uh, right now, but she's also had leadership positions throughout her career, including including leading global mobile monetization strategy in her time at Google. So we're fortunate to have both these ladies with us. I'm going to turn it over to to Cheta to kick it off and give us kind of a, a deeper history of her her career, uh, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, to make to make this brief, but to not skip on any details, I started my career in 1996 at a little Netscape, at a little startup called Netscape. Um, some of you may be familiar with that. And then after Netscape, I went over to Apple around 1998 and was a part of sort of building out sort of the very early i um, digital products over at Apple, and also worked in executive recruitment at Apple. So I sort of got to see sort of that that whole process and. I moved to Seattle and then joined Amazon when they were just 800 people in 2003. Um, and then after three years at uh, Amazon, um, I joined Google and was at Google for a little over a year and decided to go into startup world. And I've been growing and scaling startups since uh, 2007. Um, and, and, and some have grown to th uh, tens of thousands of people and have IPO'd and some have it. So I have lots and lots of lessons around startups, um, created my own company. So after um, I worked with Mark and Reason at Netscape, and then he asked me to come and help be able to reorganize Mozilla. And then from them, I, I started my own little startup. And this was sort of right when um, he was starting and Reason Horowitz. And then I helped grow early stage, comp early, early stage startups and we um, worked with Amazon on, on a special project and they liked what we had accomplished and sort of Groupon came in and said, can you do this for us? And we said, we're focused on Amazon. So they said, we'll buy you then. And then that's how the bidding war happened. And uh, I had two partners and we said, oh my goodness, here we are sort of three audacious girls um, creating this bidding war with Groupon. And then after being at Groupon for five years, I grew to leading all global uh, talent and recruiting. I then went back into um, help, helping organizations be able to reorganize. And so um, being able to sort of unravel sort of cultural issues where companies sort of find themselves sort of at um, at a crossroads. And then went back into startup world uh, and, and grew startups once again to thousands of people. And uh, recently I have ventured into once again, starting my own company where I work primarily with very early stage um uh, founders and I help find co-founders and I help find their founding engineering teams and and so my passion is entrepreneurs and and I've seen um, startups succeed and I've seen seen startups fail and that chemistry that co-founders have and that first founding team and the ability to define your culture and your mission is so important that I really wanted to focus on helping startups do that right and that's my organization called Proda. Awesome. Amazing. Well, I uh, hard act to follow, Cheta. Oh, sorry. I, I will do my best. But first, I have to say hello to Bethany. Nice to see you. I love that there's still some Zooglers after my many years away that I still recognize. So nice to see you, Bethany. Um, 
quick uh, background on me. Yes. Yeah, so um was at Google from 07 till uh, about 2015. Um, and I, yeah, exactly, Bethany, go Canada, part of the tribe. Uh, and uh, where I had the great pleasure of my very first job at Google was working on a team with Chris Fong. So we too run very, very deep. Um, and you'll hear he plays in my career journey. So uh, as Catherine mentioned, I was running a mobile app publisher strategy before I left. And, um, you know, Chris had been po poking at me actually probably for two or three years saying, you should just go, you're going to go, you're going to go run a company, Suzanne. And I didn't, I didn't really have that ambition. Um, I really thought I'd be a COO somewhere like somebody's right hand. Anyway, Chris clearly has good foresight. So here I am in my second CEO seat unexpectedly, but uh, I got the chance to go and join a startup that was based in Toronto. So I got to reconnect with my Canadian roots, help them build out their revenue teams in the US, help them build out their programmatic revenue, things of that nature. Um, a company called Wattpad, so super fun. I just had felt that I'd lost a little bit of the impact part of my job at Google as we'd grown so large in that time that I'd been there. Um, and from there, um, we I, I, I took some time off. Uh, I can talk to you guys about that, uh, working with a founder, uh, and and learning that what they tell you maybe not be may not be exactly what they actually want, uh, and what that experience was like uh, to for the you know for an overachieving A type person to be sat down by the CEO and said yeah thanks for delivering all this revenue growth but no thanks um, you know you're too expensive and I'm freaking out about costs so uh, you know see you later so that was quite um, a a tough experience but one that I really treasure quite frankly in terms of shaping um, my view on work and where it fits into my life. So hopefully that's something I can share with all of you who I know some of you have have, have had that experience recently. Um, and then since then, I uh, met people through my time at Wattpad who found out I'd left, picked up the phone and called me and said, you left, what are you doing? Uh, we have this amazing president job. We need to build out our US team. We hear you're really good at that. And I was like, well, I'm eight and a half months pregnant. How do you feel about waiting for... Uh, for, for six months and uh, they were willing to wait, um, which I think is also a great life lesson. I'm sure Chetta can speak to that of the like willing to wait for the right candidate. Um, you always will. And uh, six months later, I was there, uh, helped them build that team, graduated to CEO of that company. And then uh, we were part of an investment group that, you know, a year and a half later of running that company and having turned it around, they asked me to go and run one of the other big businesses where the two co-founders were, were stepping back from their day-to-day -day duties and wanting to take uh, chair roles on the board. So that's where I am now, almost two years into that gig. So that is the whirlwind tour of my career and looking forward to hopefully sharing some other highlights that might be useful. That's amazing. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Chetta. Uh, so I, I have to start with a question that's come up in a lot of our sessions, and that is the decision to leave Google. For you both, you've had such tremendous and successful careers beyond Google. Google does not define you, but did you, I mean, did you hesitate at all leaving Google? It's such a wonderful place to be. Talk to me about that decision and how you made it and how you knew it was time. I'm going to let you start with this, Suzanne, because you're the, I left Google. I already alluded to it, didn't I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, super. I think, well, listen, I think, Catherine, to answer that one, it's it is tricky. It's it's It was a really tough decision um, because I think there's so many weird additional pressures in choosing to leave Google, be it like your parents finally being super excited to be able to say you work at Google and not have to worry about explaining whatever your job actually is, right? I mean, quite frankly, that was literally a thing my mom said to me after I'd left. She didn't kind of sway me, but she's like, yeah, it's a lot harder to explain what your job is now. <laughs> People used to just be impressed. You worked at Google. Um, so all the way from like weird, you know, family pressure to your own identity, Google does a really good job of creating incredible culture. But with that comes this identity of Google being part of who you are and what your value is and separating what your individual value is from the association with the company is hard. And I think takes sometimes a few tries for folks. Um, so uh, that's one of one of the things for me that was really hard. Um, I'd spent, you know, a big part and a formative years of my career there. It was like, who am I going to be after this? But the ultimate reason for me 
for leaving was, you know, I'd come in at such a time where we were still talking about 20% time projects with engineers, right? If anybody had a good idea, we were going to fund it. It was very entrepreneurial still. And by the time I was leaving, I was like, okay, we just did this product uh, release. It's going to create $100 million in new revenue next year. And it was genuinely like a drop in the bucket. And it sort of started to be like, I'm putting so much of myself into this work. And I don't actually feel like I'm making a meaningful impact. Like I genuinely feel if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, it doesn't matter. And that's not how I want to live my life. Like I give so much of my time and, and, you know, emotional energy to work. I need it to give me something back that feels a bit more meaningful. So that was a big part of, um, the reason I, I wanted to leave. And one of the other things I would say is, you know, I when I came and joined Google, one of the first things I did maybe a year in was uh, take a GMAT class. There was a whole cohort of us at that time taking a GMAT class. And by the time I got to the end of that GMAT class, I was watching all these MBA graduates apply for my job. And I was like, what am I doing? This doesn't seem like a good investment. And so I looked at my time at Google as an opportunity to basically have a hands-on MBA. I did a lot of different jobs, uh, buy side, sell side, you know, product, strategy, et cetera. And, and I took that opportunity to just learn, 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 but it did still feel like college, if I'm honest. It always felt like there was a safety net. It never really felt like I had to just independently stand on my two feet, own two feet. And I wanted a chance to see if I was actually any good at my job or if I was really actually kind of average and, you know, surrounded by this like wonderful machine that printed money. Um, so those are kind of the two big reasons for me that I left, but also some of the things that made it really difficult, the social pressures, the identity, um, but all very, very surmountable. And I promise, as you can see from this group, you will always be a Zoogler. You will always have that identity uh, with you, even if you're no longer within the walls of of the building anymore. So that's my story. Um, I'll pass it back to Chetta. You win the prize. You win the prize for the best <laughs> articulation of what all of us have been feeling and struggling with and dealing with. So, so thank you. That, <laughs> that, that, that covers it. I mean, <laughs> uh, exactly. Exactly. I feel like I just had a hug. Um, <laughs> and so my story was I, my journey was Netscape, Apple, Amazon, and Google. And so I had a real, I, I essentially was just blessed with the companies that I had a chance to work with and the organizations that I worked with. And my experience at Google was wonderful, especially coming from three years at Amazon, where um, working at Amazon was like being on Survivor. And then you're at Google where people are collaborative and they're kind and um, and Google fed you, right? <laughs> uh, um, and then at the time, I I realized where where the gaps were in my career, and I I had never ventured into startup world, and I hadn't experienced startup world. And so, um, uh, what I do in my private life, I'm an international adventure racer, so I go into the world in crazy places in um, international locations and just figure my way out uh, across vast distances with just a GPS. And and so it was the same type of taking a leap of faith. And I I, I wanted to understand startup world. Um, and so that's why I, I left was it wasn't to leave Google. Um, Google was wonderful, but I realized that um, at some point, would I be stereotyped as someone that was very good and effective in large systems and large companies? And can I sort of create um, missions and can I create cultures v versus being compatible in them? And so that was my journey to go into startup world, uh, but loved my time at Google. And yes, I, I was well fed. So I, I, I literally had the Google 15. Uh, so I have to ask you, you, you have to share with us your, your private, you, you hinted at it. I, 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 I call Chad a superhero. So <laughs> you have to share with this group, your hobby. <laughs> so I, um, I'm a, a equestrian. Uh, and so I do endurance racing. So I will do hundred to thousand mile races and I have a string of endurance horses. So in the U S I do a lot Lot of we go into places like the Grand Canyon and we go into the wilderness and then you you essentially race 100 miles over a period of about 12 to 14 hours 
Um, but once a year, I'll I'll race a thousand miles across Patagonia or from Ulubotar into Siberia. And I was, and even I raced the Southern Horn of Africa where it's just you, a horse and a GPS and you're on your own. And all you can bring is um, essentially 11 pounds on your saddle. That's all you have to survive on. And, uh, and, and as I think about, especially when there's, you're going to have questions about the thinking about the C-suite and especially as a woman being brave, right? And then learning how to take these leaps of faith and learning to have, have confidence. And 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 even that grit of uh, you're in um, you're in physical pain, you're in dangerous circumstances, but you just have to figure your way through. And so I loved that that experience because of how it builds you and how you grow. And then when you're facing a very cranky CEO, and essentially everything that you had, um, everything in your plan should have worked out didn't it's a re- really great to build that courage to be able to embrace bad news right so um and when you when you put yourself and this is one of the recommend recommendations i would offer to people is do are there something new like something that's new to you or something that's scary and build those brave muscles um and but also i i love adventure and and i love horses so that's a big part of it too Amazing. Amazing. So please tell me we don't have to be able to race a hundred miles on horseback to be able to confront the C-suite. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's turn to that for a second here. One, one woman's hundred miles is another woman's <laughs> one mile. So one you know, just embrace the challenge that lays before you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. No. So seriously, if you can think back to your first sort of scary encounter, in the C-suite, how did you prepare yourself? What was the post-mortem after the fact? What kind of learnings can you share with this group of how, how to mentally prepare yourself for that encounter? So Susan, I'm going to let you start with this one. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was sort of like going through the Rolodex a little bit on that one. What's interesting for me is sort of, I might I might pivot it a little bit, which is maybe more about um, facing a board um, as a right. CEO. Um, I, I think what's, you know, I, I mentioned this to Catherine when we were chatting a little bit. I, I don't know if you guys have seen that meme about your career where it's like you spend your first however many years of your career looking into meeting rooms and desperately wanting to be in those meetings. And then you spend the next however many years of your career in those meetings, desperately wishing you were no longer in those meetings. Um, I think that the this job is very much like that. Um, I think, you know, it has the illusion of like, you know, you're sitting at the top, you're running the organization, Every sits, everything sits on your shoulders, which is absolutely true. You're accountable. I'm a very, very much like a, the buck stops here. And, uh, you know, ultimately I take responsibility for the decisions we've made in the business, but I have way more bosses than one manager to manage. I uh, have an entire board uh, to manage. And so in terms of, for me, that, that experience, I, I remember the first time going into um, a board meeting and facing our board and it being quite an intimidating experience because A, it was my first time, um, but B, I was shockingly the only woman in the room. Um, and so, you know, you're sort of playing to those dynamics of of like, okay, what's the, what's the culture here in this room? Um, how do I present in a way that is going to connect with this audience, uh, particularly as I think, uh, you know, Chad alluded to like delivering bad news. Um, it's all sunshine and roses when you get to report good news. But I think what you learn really quickly when you've got a stakeholder group like that is even good news, often they'll find some something to poke and prod at you about. Uh, they're gonna that they feel that is their job at all times is to constantly find the holes, find a little angle that you have not considered. So I think for me it was yeah, intimidating, but it was all about the 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 Google kind of DNA that I brought to that was about that like ruthless prioritization of how I was going to prepare for that meeting, making sure that I had, you know, every angle I thought possible. I'd done my research. I knew every single board member that I was going to be facing and the other companies in their portfolios that they were sitting on. And, you know, just doing that preparation side that I think I really learned in my time at Google of just being really uh, disciplined about spending, you know, 
10 to 20 times amount of time that you do actually performing, right? I'm an ex-athlete myself. It's like I spent 90% of my time practicing softball and about 10% of it executing. And I have to approach business in the same way. So in that experience, that first one actually ended up being okay. But what I think is more interesting is to talk to you about one uh, that I had more recently, which is um, having to tell my board that we were potentially going to uh, have a loss making year. Uh, not a fun meeting to go into. Um, and uh, I think the the biggest thing for me uh, in that experience was 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 learning that not trying to show up with all the answers is sometimes the best uh, approach when you are delivering really bad news. And I'd be interesting, Chetta, to kind of hear your take on having been in those rooms as well, because I I, I found and I I found that uh, what I'm the one receiving, that's my frustration. If somebody tries to tell me they've got all the answers already, even when the news is really bad, it's like, no, we don't have all the answers. We've got to find a way through this. So, so focusing in on saying, here are all the things I have done but I am but one human and I am but one human with one team. You all have this wealth of experience. I need you to help me see what I'm not seeing uh, was a far more effective way for me to interact with a board. And I think it's a bit disarming for a board because, um, you know, I think female CEOs are much more likely to, to take that approach than our male counterparts who want to show up blustery, very, you know, and I'm, I'm making gross generalizations, um, but but some of them who've grown up in that in that uh, culture of like the male CEO is dominant and has all the answers, it's a bit disarming for them, and I've found it to be really productive and a way to get through it. But but don't get me wrong, it's like put my friggin' game face on for that board meeting, and then I take the rest of the afternoon off. Sometimes, like I literally that board meeting, I needed the rest of the day. I did not take another meeting because it was just I just got hammered and I knew I had to take it I knew I had to take it on the chin and it was like all right go recover you know get some time to to get in the right frame of mind again and know that you just had to take that and then get back in the ring you know rested thoughtful aligned with the folks that you need to kind of get through to the other side of it so hopefully um some helpful value there but also the insight that you know you know, no illusion that the CEO is just chilling at the top here. Uh, way more bosses. Quite frankly, I wish I just had one manager, <laughs> not not a whole board's worth. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Um, and, to, and so I've had um, C-suite experience as an individual contributor that was providing a service to the executive team. Uh, from um, So, uh, and it's a very different experience when you're part of a team that is interacting and providing a service to the executive team. So one was um, uh, being able to just display a list of candidates for a number of VP roles and here are the packets and, and here's the data that you need to make a decision and let's sort of take notes and follow up on that activity. So there's that experience. And, and in that experience, you need to be organized, you need to be professional, and you you, you need to you need to deliver and you need to be very detail-oriented. Um and but the experience on the C-suite when you're the one making decisions and you're the one it's you on the line when things go wrong is um like and when I say um really good at delivering bad news, like even celebrate bad news, where when you're presenting an update, it's um here was our plan, here's how uh, here's how we're tracking to plan, where 10% below. We're 10% below because we've um we we found that there was sort of a dip in our branding and there was a dip in our branding that we have from this data. Um here are sort of three uh three um options that we think could could solve this. Um, we're going to put those into place and we'll let you know um sort of what the result of that is. And so when I say celebrating bad news, owning it. Um, and so as an executive, you can't take things personally. You are the first, uh, the executive team is the is a line of defense for the organization. So you're there not only to create and inspire, but you're you you're there to make sure that you're catching everything that could possibly go wrong. That's your job. And then when you're presenting to the CEO or you're presenting um, at a meeting and even to the board meeting, make it very matter of fact. 
um, here was the plan, here's why we're not going to plan. And here are, um, here's sort of how we have, you know, here's how we sort of diagnose what the problem is and here's what we're going to do to do about it. And hopefully sort of we're thinking this will solve it and we'll keep you posted. So even being ahead of that. But also uh, being an executive is about impact. And you have to bring clarity on what that impact is because impact can mean different things to different organisations. And and then what's your impact and then work backwards from there and be really clear, having a lot of clarity. Um, here's what my scope is and being really good also at standing up and saying, based upon the scope and the resources that we have, this is what we can deliver. Um, if you want to deliver all of this, you need to give me more money or more people or we take some of these features or we take some of these deliverables off. And this also comes to the notion of celebrating bad news. You have to be really good. Don't always say no. Um, say, this is what you want, but this is what we can do. And then being really really, really clear. So I would say define your impact, work backwards on what you want that impact to be, and then be, and then having clarity and always communicating with clarity. And that also, that strategy working upwards, but also that strategy with your team. Um, when you have a team, you are responsible, essentially you're branding for your team, you're the evangelizer for your team. And being really clear on what the problems are, what the mission is, but also ensuring that if you're leading second level managers or if you're leading a direct team, being really clear about what each of the, your, your team's impact is and how they can get from A to B. And then you're making really defined waypoints for, um, for what you need from them and what you expect from them. Um, and so that would be the advice. Um, is really don't see bad news as um, you know something and and granted I haven't been a C, had a C, I haven't been a CEO with a board, um, but learn to use it as a way to think of it as your first line defense for the company, and that you're always on top of how we need to be innovative and how we need to think about the risks and have a plan. Um, and that's a gr and that's a great way to build trust. And once you have trust with the executive team, then when when more things go wrong, they trust that you've got it. Um, and when you have trust with the executive team, when you have a great idea and it means thinking outside of the box and doing something new and crazy, they'll give you leadway because they'll know you've got it. And so that's my best advice um, on um, being able to sort of really manage a successful career within the C-suite and then and then competing against the, you know, your male competitors or male bosses that will have a very sort of maybe brash and very direct tone um, or maybe sort of very jocular type of tone. Um, that's always worked for me and for other um, executives that I've really admired. Awesome. Well, so many things to follow up on there. I, I, I have to ask you, because I, I know this group would love to hear, you, you've built so many executive teams with, you know, the top executives. Can you give us a little bit of insight of what they're looking for, what makes a great candidate for them, and what, you know, we talked a little bit about what, what makes the difference between those that they pick and those that they don't. And then, of course, same question for Suzanne, when you're building out your team, what are you looking for? Great. So, so Suzanne, I'll let you go first because I dominated the last five minutes because I also want to learn from you. Oh, well, likewise, likewise. They're, 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 all of us are learning today. Uh, make, make no mistake. Um, yeah, I think, you know, interestingly, for, for what it's worth, I, I do think that there is um, a very personal element to building out leadership teams um, as a CEO or as a founder. There's an element of your own set of values that you believe um, are going to help build the rest of the culture of the company because it really, you know, flows top down. And so from that standpoint, I think it's really important to understand, you know, the executive team, the founder or the CEO's background. Um, and there's some shortcuts, which I know uh, Chetta will talk about in terms of the categories of where these folks may have come from, um, which I'll, I'll let her talk a little bit about. But um, for me, it is quite personal. So 
when I think about building out executives teams, one of the things that's most important for me, and I'd say one of the biggest mistakes I've made in hiring is something that's quite hard to interview for, um, but Chet has actually already said it already, which is grit. You know, this idea of um, somebody's willingness and ability to push through the challenging times and their desire to sort of draw others into that to get across those challenging times. Um, it's it's really easy to demonstrate what an incredible contributor you will be and what impact you might have when you've never faced meaningful adversity. And, and, and what's important for me is that doesn't mean um, because, of course, many of you are coming maybe recently from your time at Google, where some folks in the market may be sort of saying, oh, well, you know, it's like life at Google was pretty easy. And like, was it really, you know, that sort of thing. Grit to me, it doesn't matter if you've not faced that adversity in your career. I just need to see it as part of who you are as a person. Have you overcome, uh, you know, adversity? Have you demonstrated grit in you know, athletics or in your personal life, personal things you've overcome, that sort of thing. That is something for me that's really important. And it's it's something that obviously is very hard to give feedback on in a candidate uh, interview process. So I think if you're out there interviewing, you know, I always do try and provide that feedback up front to folks about what the values are that we have as an organization and that I have as a leader in building teams. Um, because it's a bit hard to give that feedback because that might be the difference, quite frankly. I might have two resumes that look exactly the same, but somebody is demonstrating to me that they've got this value that is really important to me in the culture of building my teams. Um, that's a little bit hard to give feedback on, you know, when you go and speak to the recruiter and I say, well, one one of these folks seem to have a little bit more grit. They just had an edge that I'm looking for. Um, so I think it's 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 that part for me, recognizing that it's quite personal, um, but also recognizing where I came from. Google has shaped me as a leader. It has shaped how I think about building teams. I am looking for more collaborative folks. I'm looking for people who are really curious. I'm looking for people, um, you know, who have interests and passions outside of their work. You know, some of those things we interviewed for at Google really have translated because I see the type of people that you bring into an organization like that. So knowing where I come from uh, and what might have shaped my own uh, perspectives and career journey um, will perhaps help you think about, okay, well, what is this leader actually looking for when I show up for an interview? So that's a couple of um, little, little, little insights. And, you know, by the way, Grit and resilience is going to come through in an interview uh, kind of journey because you're you're going to get it's like dating you know you're going to get way more no's than you're you, than you are going to get yeses and so don't take it personally because quite frankly it might be that personal edge that is a difference in what that leader is looking for that you don't bring and that's going to be a marriage of a work relationship that's ultimately not going to go well anyway right um, so that wasn't the fit for you in any case so I just. I know how tough it is to interview, so hopefully it helps to hear, you know, don't take it personally um, and, you know, stay gritty. Exactly. And sometimes, like, trust that the company is making the right decision and it's in your best interests yeah. if they don't, sometimes if they don't go with you as well. So don't take it personally. Um, and then from, oh, my goodness, many, many years of, um, leading executive searches and making executive decisions, I would say that it sort of come, comes down to four elements. One is pedigree. The other is branding. Then there's experience. But there's also leadership. And it, the leadership qualities uh, are, are taken very, very seriously at the executive level. When you're interviewing up through the ranks, and le le leadership qualities are sort of a nice to have, but you, they'll tend to focus on role-related knowledge or there may be some other areas. But leadership is really important on that on that executive side. And so when I so around pedigree, it's uh, that's the company that you come from, the products that you've worked on. Um, sometimes it can be the universities that you've um, that you've attended. Uh, when it comes to saying we want to interview these people, essentially pe pedigree and experience will get you uh, that first interview. And so when when looking at if there's a company that you really want to work at or if there's a job that you want to apply for, um, take a look at the people that um, that work there. Um, and then 
um, get a sense of the communication tone from that organization. There's lots of people who work for that organization that will do blogs or they'll they'll set out press releases, they'll do YouTube videos. There's um, always a communication to a style guide to that communication. And then as you're uh, applying, um, think about what they value and, and communicate in and sort of what you've assessed as, as their, their tone. Um, and then when it when you're interviewing, it um, it's really around is this someone that is going to be a competitive advantage for us? Right. The reason they're looking for an executive is they want to be able to dominate sort of X industry or they want X amount of growth in X industry. And so they're looking for a leader who's going to be able to provide the strategy, provide the know-how and lead the, the you're, you're the wayfinder. And so really sort of think about interviewing like you're a way, like you are the one that will provide the greatest advice, that you have the greatest strategies, you have the experience um, in order to um, elevate where the organization wants to go. And normally there's a really large, the reason a company is looking for an executive, there's a large pivot point that has happened. One is there's um, exponential scale. The company is growing and so they need to find a VP of operations to be able to st streamline um, you know, a, a lot of sort of what is chaotic now. Or they're, they're, they're moving into sort of a new product line. They see an opportunity. And so hiring executive means that the company, there's a pivot point. So try to really understand sort of what that pivot point is. And once again, it's easy to do that through research, through some of the press releases, um, sort of what, uh, what the press is saying about the company. Um, and understand sort of what that pivot point is going to be and prepare your interview around presenting yourself best for that particular pivot point. And that's another big difference in um, interviewing on the executive level versus on the individual contributor level. And then leadership is really important. And um, and this is where you, um, as an executive, the CEO, if you're, if you're reporting into the CEO or if you're reporting into um, a, another C-level role, um, they essentially, you need to be their go-to person. Um, and so this is where grit and communication and det being detail-oriented and being able to build trust is essentially what they're looking for. Um, and, and then also someone that can build a team and, and lead a team. They don't want an executive that's going to come in and then there's uh, uh, everyone quits under them. Um, or they want in, or there's leadership gaps that they see and they want the executive uh, to come in and be able to sort of really help with some of those leadership gaps. And so these are question, really great questions to ask. Um, and then also uh, when it comes to branding, um, the, and this is something that's really important, the, um, the executives that sometimes it comes down to there's three great people and we think they'll all be awesome. And there's there's only a tiny differential between the one we decide to give an offer to and the other two. And you really need to be good about defining what that differential is. And one could be how relevant your experience is to their product and to the problems they're needing to solve. So you have to be really good about knowing that about yourself. Um, it could also be, um, something small as 99.99% of organizations will always do a backdoor reference, right? So they do due diligence references. And we were doing due diligence references on three of the final candidates and we weren't able to get any due, dil due diligence references, which is a backdoor channel, on one of the candidates. And so we wanted to make a decision quickly and so we couldn't go with them. Um, and, and so even knowing how to sort of prepare for that search. So, um, reach out to one, something that I would recommend is if there's a job that you feel very passionately about, reach out to those that you've worked with that were in your sphere of influence and, and, and the folks that, that you directly interacted with, um, and then let them know that you're interviewing for a role that you're very passionately about, you passionately feel about. And, and if the company reaches out to them for a reference, if you uh, be authentic, but if you could promptly respond and you 
we would appreciate that. And there's sort of really great ways that you can ask that so that people will um, respond. And sometimes um, you'll have someone within your network that'll be connected with someone within that company. And be bold and ask for a recommendation. So you'll say, just say there's a, a Lisa Smith um, is uh, worked with someone that's on the executive suite. And you could say, Lisa, um, I see that you're connected to this executive. Um, I feel really passionate about the role. Um, yeah, I would appreciate if you could make a recommendation for me directly to your contact. And sometimes that's the difference too, is there was a direct connection between someone um, we respected um, and we respected their feedback and the person that we were hiring. And so when you are interviewing for a job that you feel passionately about, think about ways that you can triangulate that role. Um, reach out to your network and say, as a heads up, um, you may be contacted as a due diligence reference and I would appreciate um, your support or your feedback um, in this. And then, oh, I also see you're connected to folks um, within this company. And um, of course, if you have the time and you're comfortable with it, I would much appreciate a recommendation. Um, and so those little things are what differentiates the three great ones to the one that we hire. Uh, and that happens in most cases where we um, were able, there was someone that was connected to someone that gave a really great reference or a recommendation to that person. That was mostly the reason why we went with one over the others that were also just as good. And, and I, I know we have a question in the chat, but I just really want to double click chat on, on something that you talked about, a little old school yeah. Google reference for those who are around for the double click days. Um, but this, this idea of notifying your network, one of the things I've noticed about a lot of, uh, you know, still current Google Googlers or folks who are, are recently left Google is <clears throat> they haven't focused on building their networks beyond the walls of Google that aggressively, because when you're in there, so much of your network are other Googlers. And so, um, don't worry about that. Uh, there's lots of folks who've landed other places. So, you know, that's the first thing I, I would really encourage folks is to spend a little bit of time working on kind of rounding out your LinkedIn network. Um, but also, it, it's not necessarily the the folks, um, and, and research has supported it, the folks that you know best who are going to help you find that next role. It's it's the power of the weak ties. So uh, I think it was the New York Times that published a piece recently about the power of weak ties versus tight ties. So um, I really encourage all of you to also be unapologetic about reaching out, as Chetta mentioned, to some of those folks that maybe you haven't talked to in two, three years, but they will remember you. They will remember working with you. Um, and most of us are, are as generous with our time because somebody did that for us as well. So um, I just wanted to kind of uh, reiterate that point because it really is a difference maker. I, I have literally not hired people because I'm like, it feels like a wild card. I don't have anybody I know who's told me this person is great for this really, really important role. We need to keep looking. So exactly. You create your own little luck circle. Yeah. And that, by the way, that is the point of Zooglers, right? I mean, you you have a network already pre-built for you, use it. Um, and I, I just want to ask one thing. I mean, I, I'm, I, there's two questions in the chat, but I want a quick follow up on something you said, Chad, there. Can you steer the references? Like, you don't know where the back channels are coming from, but is it is it enough to proactively reach out and say, I know somebody who's connected, this person can provide a reference, can that short circuit the sort of back channel that you don't know where it's coming from? Does is or or does it really have to be a totally blind reference to count? I think it has to be a totally blind reference to count because they want to ensure that they're speaking to someone that isn't an ally of yours and is going to just give them a rosy story. Uh, and so the way that back channel references work is we want to know in instances where you fail. We want to know, um, you know, were you able to influence without authority? What was your communication style like? So when we reach out to um, to backdoor references, it's wanting to to risk. It's risk mitigation. Um, where are all the areas you could create chaos in the organization, or where are all the areas you could fail within this role? 
And so uh, when you provide a, a person, we assume that you've, they're going to be your ally and they, they most likely will give a rosy picture. And so that's why just reaching out to your network of folks that were in your sphere of influence or you worked with to say, just as a heads up, um, they may be contacting you. And I just appreciate uh, if you were to respond quickly and please feel free to be authentic um, and open about the feedback. Perfect. Um, yeah. Tam, I think Tammy, did you want to ask a question? Yes, please. Hi, um, thank you so much for this. So I've been recently looking at COO roles or chief of staff roles with startups. And um, I have a several part question. One is I've been highly customized my res customizing my resume and a cover letter, but oftentimes I haven't been able to find a connection point because they're so small or it just don't have it. Um, so I was wondering if you had advice there. That's the first one. The second one is I'm actually more worried that I believe in their mission, but actually believe that they believe in their mission. So I kind of, I really just want to interview them, but I don't want to come on too strong. So there's that element of, um, A, how do I find those missions that I really believe in? So that's, I guess it's question two. And three, how do I find out how well they believe in their mission before I even go through all the extra effort of trying to get in the door? I guess those are my first three questions. I have another one, but um, just in case, because of time, I'll wait on that. Can I answer that question? Yeah. So for an early stage startup, they would love what would be considered, like they would respond very positively. If you were to send a connection request through LinkedIn and say something like, I've, we have connections in common. I've heard wonderful things about you um, from, from folks that we, um, we, we share a connection with. Um, and I wanted to send a warm, warm invite to connect. Um, and also I have, questions about your mission and I'd love to interview you mm, okay um, and so focus and then there's a higher probability that they'll respond to the connection request and then they'll and then if you say I I was fasc fascinated by your mission and I actually have some questions about your mission um, I'd, I'd love to interview you um, you'd have a, a I would say um, you know you, you would get some bites from that and so okay. Send it as a connection request and be bold and even say, I saw your mission, but I saw your product. And I'm just curious why you came to this because I am um, at the moment, I'm a, a, a COO. Um, I'm at the sort of COO level for startups mm -hmm. and I would love to, to hear your thoughts. Right? Uh, and, and so founders are very passionate. This is a baby and they feel very strongly about their mission and they will debate you on their mission. And so it's a really great way to make a connection. Um, and so even if you don't have that connection, the fact that you reached out, um, you would probably get a bite. That's um, such a good idea. Because I have done this via cover letter where I sort of hint at the, you know, but I have questions about this. But I'm, I'm sort of like, this probably isn't the right approach. And I get no response on that. So <laughs> I was hoping they would buy it and be like, what do you mean you have questions about this thing? But I but, love the you're using a connection request. That's that's really mm -hmm. fun. And startups are bold and startup founders love to debate. And they feel um, very passionate about their mission and why this is the right idea at this time. And so sometimes when you send them a challenge, a very respectful challenge, and you want to learn more about why they think this is going to work, you'll get a higher response rate than if you were to send a highly curated resume and cover letter. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. That sounds brilliant. And then the other thing is, how do you find those startups that have the mission that you feel passionate about? Because I feel like it's so hit or miss. <laughs> I mean, there's a couple other questions. I'm going to, I'm going to cut you oh, off. Sorry. And... Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give Jenna a, a chance to ask her question. If we, if we have time, we'll come back to you. Great. Yeah. Um, my question is, I, um, I got to the level of VP level and then the thing that made me kind of pause at going to C-suite is I every project I assume I, and the company I take on as my own child, like my baby. And so the challenge I had at the VP level and I saw going into the C-suite level is taking on more responsibility and taking ownership of the company and feeling responsible for it when they're, maybe the CEO is making decisions I wouldn't agree with and there being that friction point. Um, and because I'm so emotionally invested, it's hard for me to not be upset 
or not uh, care about the direction of the company. So I, I'm asking more about mindset and longevity of stepping up into leadership roles where you're taking on more responsibility, but sometimes you got to let go of the outcome because sometimes it's beyond your control. Like I cognitively understand that, but just because I tend to really care about what I'm building, it's hard for me to separate. And I'm noticing that happens as I'm assuming more leadership, the more I care and the more I take on ownership. So I'm just wondering about how to do that in a sustainable way of stepping up into more while also being able to let go sometimes. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in there, Jenna. Um, it's a it's a super personal um, question for me <clears throat> because I I I really feel it. Uh, you know, in in my deepest atoms of my body, <laughs> you know, you kind of have to 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 assume this this level of responsibility. You know, the idea at its most simple level of like you are responsible for however many people's you know ability to put a roof over their family's heads and do the things that they love and all of that. You know, so um, I I think. It is a tough lesson, and I'm not sure there's a there's an easy way to um, train yourself for it. You know, it's sort of one of those things. I think you have to live through. I think what you can do, though, and 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 is really important, is to make sure that in the process of identifying the leader or leadership team that you are going to be joining in an executive level role, is that there's a fundamental ability to understand that, yes, at the end of the day, the CEO may make decisions you don't agree with. I am super upfront with that about my, with, with everybody. It's, it's literally like the first time we have a, a our kickoff meeting or frankly, in the inter, interview process, I talk about that. Like I am hiring you because you are an expert in your domain, but that doesn't mean that I'm always going to go with your decision because you have to remember, I am looking at the whole picture, right? I have to constantly look at the, the 360. My job is to bring you along as best I can, even when you don't agree with my decision. Um, and we are all in that boat together. That's the type of leadership team and culture that I need to build. And so I think for you stepping into that, living through it, the, that emotional feeling and connection you feel to it is not going to go away overnight. Like it, it just isn't. I can relate very, very much. You heard me talk about that awful, awful board meeting where like I, I feel it in, in my heart, in my being, I need to step away and I need to go and reset and give myself some time to kind of get back my head in the game because it is emotional for me as well um but you can learn to compartmentalize that and and if you have a foundation of trust in the team and an understanding that your voice is going to be heard and considered and nine out of ten times you're going to be brought along as to why the decision was made even if you don't agree with it um you can trust the other 10 percent of the time when that decision gets made without you having the full picture of it. So I think really interviewing for, uh, I think uh, uh, it was Tammy who was asking about interviewing. I expect that if you're not interviewing me, you're not, a, you're yeah. not a, at the executive level, quite frankly, like please pack your things and yeah. carry on. Like it has to be mutual. So you need to interview for that and understand has this leader really built that kind of culture. And in the same way that uh, mm -hmm. we want to back channel reference, you should try and do the same, right? Can you back channel somebody who's left or somebody who is still there, you know, hear what it's actually like when those teams have faced adversity and what that leader shows up like and how they support, support their teams. Hopefully that's exactly cool. And then I've been in I've been in meetings, um, especially at um, you know yearly planning and quarterly reviews, where uh, C level folks, um, the the most effective ones, um, you know they will disagree and commit. They will have um, strong opinions loosely held, and they're really good at. Um, making sure that you're solving the right problems and they're really good at first principles thinking and pushing pushing back but they do have strong opinions loosely held and and so the final decision is normally um a kaleidoscope of all those discussions and of all the areas where risk can happen of all the um areas where opportunity there is opportunity and then they come to a final decision and and being um and CEOs, and, and Susan, you may appreciate this, 
CEOs appreciate your honesty and they and you you can disagree respectfully and present the data, present your case, present your why, and you're doing it in the benefit of the organization. And that's exactly the COO. That's exactly the executive that is a competitive advantage to a company and, and that will do well. So we have two minutes Thank left. You. I'd like to, yeah, if we have time for maybe one more question, which is like final tips for folks on how to position themselves for these C-suite roles, whether on LinkedIn or brand, you mentioned branding, Cheddar generally, we, we all know a lot of these positions are not posted. Um, so any final thoughts for how folks in, on the call can position themselves to, to get the seat? And so I might actually um, answer two questions with that one. Um, and so there was a question on how do I find mission? Right. And there are some there's some really great accelerators and sometimes companies that have grown and, and they've scaled like are still on the accelerator websites. And so you can actually search for the domain that they're in or sort of you can search for their purpose and sort of at what level they are. Um, and a lot of executive roles actually aren't posted because um, they'll go out to executive search firms. And so create a list of executive search firms like um, like True Search and, and Riviera and Hydric and Str Struggles. And then, um, and then reach out and pitch to these executive search firms because 90% of the roles that you're looking for, especially if it's at the VP and the C-suite level, are mostly managed by those those search firms and those search firms also have really strong relationships with a lot of um, sort of VCs um, and with, with with venture funds and so the, and then they'll pitch you um, a number of the organizations that could be interesting for you if you if you really like startups one good startup um, one really good startup executive firm is Riviera and so um uh, where the the tailored resume and the the really great cover letter, where that will benefit you is by reaching out to those executive search firms and recruiters at these executive search firms. Um, also, uh, be bold when there's news about funding. And so I sign up to a lot of the newsletters, a lot of the VC newsletters on who's moving. Um, and so if there's an announcement of a new CEO at X company, I look to where they were and then I would reach out to that company and say, um, I saw that um, Lisa Smith um, um, joined this other company um, and I think that I would be able to bring to your organization sort of where your product strategy wants to go if you're in the search of the COO. And so that's another way to find really great um, opportunities. And then if a, a startup gets funding, um, then reach out to the, um, connect with the CEO. So send a really nice connection. And in that connection, say, uh, I heard wonderful things about your company. I'm a fan and I'm following your career. I'd love to connect. And um, and then, you know, maybe 10% of them will accept. And when they do accept, then say, I noticed that you got some more funding and uh, you don't have a COO. So you need to hire me as your COO. And that's how a lot of these folks get hired. You have to um, you have to be really good at researching where those opportunities are, especially at the VP level in the C-suite. Um, and chances are, if it is a VP role that has been posted or if it's a C-suite role that has been posted on a major site, it's because they're posting it because of um, you know, they want to be able to, they have reports um, in diversity and they have, uh, they need to make sure they need to post it in as many places as possible. And then as you're, cement, as you're submitting those resumes, it goes into a very large inbox of another thousand resumes. And so sometimes the reasons that you're not getting a callback is by a uh, applying um, you should still apply because you need to put every as many eyes as many fires is good um, but doing that due diligence of who's leaving who's who's got funding what mission do I really like and then pitching yourself to those organizations you'll actually get um, closer to landing that job than if you were to just apply to to you know job postings Great tips. Thank you, Teta, for the, for the wisdom. Suzanne, any, any final words for our group before we? Uh, just um, 
trust your unbelievable training and pedigree that you have had in your time at Google. Um, it will serve you well. You'll be um, amazed and shocked at some of the things you take for granted in the way that you have been taught to work that doesn't exist everywhere. And the odd things where you're creating value in organizations that you had no idea was a value creation um, area. And um, yeah, just, I think, uh, stay gritty. Like I said, get out there. Don't take it personally. Um, the right role is going to find you. You're going to find your right partner and, and do not be afraid to interview them. Um, you deserve the best next job. So make sure that you are interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you because uh, you're going to bring an amazing talent, I'm sure, to wherever you land next. Um, and I saw in the in the comments here, uh, yes, I count me a weak tie. Uh, find me on LinkedIn. Very, very happy to be connected with any and all of you um, and, and happy to answer more questions if they arise later. It's so wonderful to be here. And Catherine, thank you for organizing it. Chetta, so great to connect with you. We just met, so I feel <laughs> my network has grown. <laughs> and I also played softball um, <laughs> at the representative level. And, and I am, consider me a weak tie. I have a really, really, really big network. So if you research a company, chances are, I may have a connection at that company. Oh, really? And so just, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, just send me a message and say, following up from um, from the, the, the Zoogle talk, I, I'm really interested in these companies. Um, can you make connections for me? And um, chances are, if I don't have a connection, I know someone who will have a connection. Amazing. Thank you both for being so generous with your time and with your connections. I really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks to everyone who joined us. And uh, that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank all. you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.